So this is uh, our second uh, public collaboration team meeting from the Monitoring, Observing, Modeling, and Prediction, or MOMP, foundational activity. And one of the goals of the MOMP uh, foundational activity is to bring uh, observationalists and modelers together to help, um, you know, use, uh, improve the improve the use of observations and models and, and vice versa to um, have the community share information. So this particular meeting is focused on one of our deliverables that is about supporting the development of metrics that measure key Arctic processes and implementation of these metrics in packages to facilitate model validation against observations. So in this meeting, we're gonna have two presentations focused on the use of observations to evaluate models. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to um, add again that we would like folks to introduce themselves in the chat and also maybe add a sentence about why you are attending this meeting or interested in this meeting. And so um, I will just start with my introduction. I'm Sally McFarlane, uh, I'm a program manager at the Department of Energy as well as one of the co-chairs for MOP. And um, for me, this meeting is interesting because I manage an observational program. So I'm always interested in understanding how people use observations to evaluate models and how we can make um, observational data more valuable for them. Um, before we move on, I see that Hazel has her hand raised. So is there something? Yeah, I just wanted to, I see that we have one person joining on the phone with a 410 area code. Um, and I just wanted to give that person a chance to introduce themselves uh, before we get started. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? We yes. can, yeah. Oh, okay. This is Liz Hoy. I'm I'm on Zoom also, but I just called in from my phone and I'm on Zoom, so I'm here both ways. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks so much, I'm, Liz. I'm a, I'm the I'm the Terrestrial Ecosystems uh, Community of Practice co-lead and also uh, represent NASA as part of the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment. Thanks. Excellent, Liz. Thanks so much for joining. And I um, also want to acknowledge uh, the other Mount co-chair, David Allen from NOAA, who um, I'm guessing has probably introduced himself in the chat or, or will shortly, and we're sort of co-moderating um, this meeting. So I will introduce our, our first speaker, who is Nathan Collier from Oak Ridge National Lab, and he's going to speak on model evaluation with ILAM and prospects for Arctic metrics and data. So please go ahead, Nathan. Okay. So I'm really happy to be here. Greetings to all you Arctic model evaluation fans. And uh, here, here just to talk about um, the work that we do with uh, ILAM through the Rubisco SFA, which Forrest Hoffman leads. It's funded out of Ray New Justice program, RGMA. And particularly, you know, how we use data frequently, right, to confront um, in that case, Earth system models and some opportunities, I think, to use the ILAM framework really in um, benchmarking Arctic uh, models as well. So just really quickly, uh, ILAM, if you've never heard that, if you've managed to somehow survive without having heard that acronym, it means the International Land Model Benchmarking, and it's really become to be quite an overloaded term. Um, because it, it means a, a lot of things and gets th thrown around in a lot of different ways, but it could be in reference really to the community. The ILM community gets together. We've had three different workshops and one planned upcoming soon where we bring modelers and, um, and uh, observationalists to try to get together and, and talk about what data is available and how we can use it to benchmark our models. And a lot of out of those conversations come a lot of data sets. We curate a lot of data that's been formatted specifically so that it can uh, be used against uh, models more easily, because a lot of times those data sets are not in a model-friendly format. And those, those data sets are available freely on our, our web, web page, as well as like through intake catalogs, if you're familiar with that Python library. Uh, it could be methods. We spend a lot of time discussing different methods for, for how models should be benchmarked, and we try to encapsulate all of those into an open source Python software package. You can look us up on, on GitHub, uh, GitHub just ILAM GitHub, um, or you can just go to ILAM.org down here, where we have a lot of this information in a lot more detail with a lot of links and things that you can follow there as well. 
Uh, or you could just be talking about you know our results. We we tend to host a lot of results so that you don't have to use the software yourself if you're really more concerned with the science results. And it, well, I'll use the results to kind of explain a little bit more about what ILAM exactly is. A lot of times you'll see presentations about ILAM and you see these types of portrait plots <clears throat> where uh, on the y-axis here you're seeing all sorts of different types of areas uh, out of the model that are benchmarked. We Right now we reference about 30 different model outputs out of, in our case, Earth system models. Um, and, and across the x-axis here, you see a whole collection of them from the CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 era. This is a one particular comparison that we support, which looks at uh, the, the models from CMIP-6 that had a CMIP-5 counterpart, because we're really interested in looking at improvements. Um, but this is really just kind of a, a, a starting point. Uh, typically, at this point, what I'll do instead is uh, take you to this web link on ilam.org, CMIP-5 versus SIC historical. And it, it's usually just easier for me to show you what our software and data sets all generate. So it comes up with a landing page, something like this. And uh, you can click on these rows and they expand to show you kind of the underlying data sets. So many times we have more than one data set, which we're using to benchmark model results. And if you click on one of those, it opens up another page that gives you a lot more detailed information about how the models performed with respect to that particular data set. And so you'll notice at first there's a big table here with all the models listed and uh, a lot of different kinds of numbers that, that are involved. But on the far right, you see a whole lot of different components of scoring that we include. So we return to you an overall score, but that is kind of a blending of scores in many different aspects of model performance. And so this gives you with some relative coloring numbers, which models are perhaps performing better. And the interesting bit, of course, is that the CMIP 6 mean model uh, performs uh, much better than any of the in individual models, which is a curiosity. Um, but when you, you click on these, uh, what's not showing up immediately because of the zoom level on the screen is that it changes all these images and will show you the benchmark reference data set mean in this, in this case, Fluxcom, but as well as what the model mean looks like. And then all sorts of things like the bias and a score map that can help you kind of zone in on where the scores are, are poor, root mean square error, and some notion of phasing the maximum uh, model. We look at the, the spatial uh, distribution of that particular data set. And then we also uh, present regional means um, to show you the kind of curves that people uh, tend to look at quite a bit. And you can see here um, the regional mean as well as the annual cycle of the given model you have selected, but it also will kind of show you the spaghetti plots that, that people look at to try to understand what's going on in their model. And it, I mean, we, we say that it's a regional uh, mean because ILAM also works on arbitrarily defined regions. So in the pull-down box here, I have just a couple of regions and um, high latitudes, could, uh, I think is of interest to this particular group. And when you select that, um, it's now the, the high lat region. Now all the numbers have changed and all of the plots are changed now to let you uh, dig in and try to understand model performance for uh, that particular region. This is kind of a single model view, but you can also go into an all models view and use your browser to kind of zoom out and then, you know, pick a particular uh, quantity that you're <clears throat> interested in in a particular region. And you may have to zoom out quite a bit depending on what you want to see, but it gives you the opportunity then to look at bias with of all these models with particular with respect to a particular data set. And so we think that this is really a, a great way to explore uh, model uh, model performance. And uh, you know we do have a lot of globally gridded data, but we also have a lot of site data, which we 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 know tends to be a lot of the data products that are coming out of a lot of these um, field experimental studies, and, and we can incorporate those too. There's an example of the exact same methodology, but applied to um, the the FluxNet collection. Uh, and currently, what ILAM does is it just picks the the grid cell out of the the global model run that is closest in terms of latitude and longitude. But of course, this could be 
changed if there's something that makes more sense and then presents a comparison much the same way also with regional means. And so we think that this is a really uh, a great way to explore uh, model performance and, and we've been successful uh, at this far. Beyond these kind of one-to-one -one comparisons, I'm showing you kind of, you have this data set and there is some analog out of the model that you wanna compare it to. ILM is set up that you can do very complicated comparisons. And so uh, here I'm showing you just a couple of um, uh, screenshots, screen grabs from a comparison we do looking at CO2 variations. Now, a lot of models don't have prognostic CO2 in them. And so what we do instead is we take the land carbon fluxes and pass them through uh, an emulator, an atmospheric emulator, and take off the trend and look at the variations. So it's kind of how do the land carbon fluxes affect those variations, and then we can compare that for all the models. So it's a pretty complicated process that's made very simple and repeatable. If, if, um, if a model simply outputs their land carbon fluxes, then we can uh, emulate them. So this is meant to kind of help you see that you can paint with a broad brush. We can use data very creatively with ILM and not just kind of the one-to-one -one variable comparisons. So how do we use this? We, we use this to try to understand how models are improving from one era to the other. I guess I assumed people are familiar with CMIP here, but this is a, a, a couple of model intercomparison projects that look at global climate models. And they're, they're, through the different phases, we can track performance and see how hopefully our models have improved. So these plots uh, here that I'm showing you are just the overall scores from the selection of models, every color there is a particular model. And on the x-axis, it was the overall score from the CMIP-5 era model. And then we're plotting the improvement. And so anything kind of over the zero axis is, is ground that we've gained. And then we provide some kind of bookkeeping to show you that most of them are improving. We have some threshold for about the same, but, but you know we, we see that some also degrade. And we find that a lot of times you, know, you make progress in one variable and it comes at the cost of another one. These models are very complicated with very intricate nonlinear effects. And so it's hard really to improve everything all at once. But on the whole, we see improvement. And we've, we've split this up by like land states and fluxes and surface climate. You can see that the surface climate doesn't look like it's improved as much, but of course, it could be much more sensitive to our scores. So a small improvement in surface climate variables it could be what is driving a lot of the major improvement in our land states and fluxes. But in a final column here, we, we look at uh, relationships, which we, which we also take a look at. And you see that this is the area where the majority of the improvement is, is seen. So we think that this reflects that from CMIP 5 to 6, models are getting better at process representation and that can be what explains a lot of the improvement. Um, so that's kind of what ILM is and what we use it for. And hopefully I think you, you can see some connection to what Arctic uh, could be more active in doing as well. We do have some Arctic focused comparisons. One of them that I didn't click on is that we look at um, model permafrost extent. And that's not a variable that models will output but we can estimate it from soil temperatures uh, through various different methods. And then what we do is we take the National Snow and Ice Data Center permafrost map, and we look at kind of a, a, a Venn diagram of permafrost area, right? So the, 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 the white bits there the, is the intersection where both the model and the map thinks that it's permafrost, and red are areas where the model has overpredicted the extent and blue is where they areas that they've missed. So we can incorporate this into a comparison and so we have an idea of how well models are um, predicting at least this from the standpoint of temperatures at soil temperatures. We also have the Kansas uh, snow water equivalent in, in, in there as well uh, but I, I'm aware that there's probably a lot of other data products that we could very easily incorporate and have better representation of high latitude processes. That's part of the reason we're interested in coming here and talking to you all. I would also say some kind of low hanging fruit here is a metric that uh, Drew Slater uh, 
came up with that is really aiming at understanding the impact that snow has on insulation. So the, the, the metric, the plot here that he's showing is kind of a relationship like metric where he's looking at the mean snow depth over the, uh, the cooling period of the year. And then what he's plotting here is a normalized uh, temperature amplitude difference. And so it's looking at how affected is the soil temperature amplitude from the air temperature amplitudes. And so the amount of snowpack has an insulating effect there. And what you notice here is a lot of the models are way outside of the, the black and, and gray curve, which really implies that there is some, there, there is some you know, process problems that there are things that the models are missing. So we, we really keen to implement more of these kinds of metrics. Sadly, Drew passed before we got this metric implemented into to ILAM and largely we're lacking some data that is uh, that has been a little difficult to, to locate. So we're kind of in the market as it were for snow, coincident snow depth data with snow, soil temperatures at 20 uh, centimeters and we could grab air temperature from a number of sources if that's not measured and it would be great to work to get this metric um, into ILAM. So uh, and it, it, beyond all of this, we do have some Arctic post focused developments. I'll mention that NG Arctic right now is in a phase four proposal. I know there's some representatives on here uh, involved with that project and, and evaluation and synthesis is a cross-cut activity in, in all the main major science questions. And so um, we, we hope that through this kind of plan to, to for, for a big push in creating kind of the data models need, particularly point regional panarctic simulations, we're hoping that that, that will have a lot of um, improvements to what ILAM can do in, in simulating processes that are uh, important to high latitudes in the Arctic. We're also really hoping to, to work again with um, the regional Arctic simulation model. Um, we had done a number of years ago with Clara Deal to, to to have ILAM read this in, and we were doing some initial work with an ocean benchmarking uh, configuration. We have that now released in our version 2.7 software. Uh, so there's a IOMB to the ILAM, but we apparently we don't say IOM, it's it's IOMB. We, we like say it out. I'm not sure why, um, but, but we now have a fully supported ocean configuration. You can find more details on ILAM.org. There's an announcement there in the and the required files that, that are necessary. And so we think this could be good news for Arctic moving forward. We're also involved in, in, a bit with some members from NASA above. They've been doing a lot of work. Um, you can go check out some results that Renato Brachieri has uh, hosted uh, on his own GitHub page. He's run it himself. And here he has the results for the above region itself. And it shows really that uh, ILAM can be tailored to suit your own needs and we're hoping to see more data sets coming out of that project, more models that the people who are associated with it. We've been working with trying to help them have ILAM read those natively, like results out of TEM, for example, and, and others. So uh, hopefully I've been able to communicate that ILAM is many things and you know, our research out of Rubisco has been focused on decadal global biogeochemical cycles, but the ILAM software itself, we've really tried to implement it in a flexible way so that it can be applied to other aspects and areas. But we really thrive on community input. If you're looking at our models and you, our results and you found that we've used a terrible data set, please let us know. And we would love to have more suggestions in terms of new data sets if you, if you know about them, especially if they're publicly available. You can make those if you just go to this GitHub repository, uh, the ILAM data repository, and there is an issue there um, we, 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 we would love it. So appreciate it. And I can take any questions that you may have now. Great. Thank you, Nathan. As we do have time for a few questions for Nathan. Um, and people can uh, raise their hand to ask a question. You can also uh, put questions in the chat. So I was wondering, Nathan, I think, um, there was a maybe a, a tab on the island page that you you didn't show that was more about the data information. So does that give kind of details on on what how the data 
sets or the data projects themselves are developed? Yeah, uh, yes. So I, I knew I shouldn't stop sharing because the instant <laughs> I did. Uh, yes, so uh, a, a convention that, that we have developed is to embed inside our, our formatted data files. We have uh, information about the original sources, about how we downloaded them, about what we did to them. Um, in some cases, we have to apply just some formatting changes. Other times, we have to fix them. So we try to keep all that information in the history. And then we also try to, to pass along the references, you know, to be good stewards of uh, that people ask if you cite this publication, will it show up? Well, it does in our data information tab. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Sally, uh, Nathan, there's a there's a question in the chat from David Lawrence, um, and it's basically uh, Nate Nate or Forrest, can you post the link to the CMIP five or CMIP six uh, results? Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, now I will stop sharing. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask one other quick question, which is about the site data. So I think most there's a, you know, I guess it's difficult sometimes when you think about global models to compare them to this, this type of site data. And is there more work you're doing on thinking about how to do those kinds of comparisons? Or is that something that's Sort of. um, you, you mean like in terms of maybe how representative mm -hmm. that particular pixel is of mm -hmm. the site characteristics? We have talked about doing things like this, um, uh, but, but it has not kind of percolated to the, 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 the top of list of things to do. But we have given it some, some thought, be something that we were open to, particularly if that's of use to the community. Mm -hmm. We have a big list of things to do. All right, thank you. Well, with that, I think we'll um, I'll pass it over to David to introduce our next speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Dave Allen. I'm a program manager with uh, with NOAA's Arctic Research Program that is embedded in the Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program uh, and co-lead of the uh, the MOMP, uh, as well as a, um, the Field Operations Community of Practice, um, in which uh, I work with uh, with a subset of you at least. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce um, Eugene Petrescu, um, who is the director of the Arctic Testbed and Proving Ground and Regional Science and Operations Officer for the National uh, Weather Service Alaska region. This will be somewhat of a different, um, different presentation, and I'll let Eugene explain that. But the National Weather Service Alaska region provides environmental decision support services covering the state of Alaska and the adjacent uh, oceanic regions from the Arctic to the Bering Sea and North Pacific. Um, the Arctic Testbed and Proving Ground is responsible for facilitating uh, the testing and evaluation of new research, guidance, forecast techniques, products, and services to improve uh, forecast processes and decision support activities in the Alaska uh, in Alaska and the adjacent Arctic. Um, he's going to provide us with an update on the um, the current activities at the Arctic Testbed and Proving Ground and um, how it looks at the skill and utility of its model guidance um, to improve, um, improve the services uh, and products uh, that it provides its stakeholders. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Eugene. Um, Eugene, please take it away. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to talk today. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen. So uh, just uh, let me know if, if uh, people can see my screen. Yes, it looks good. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, just a, a little bit of background about uh, um, the test bed and you know, where we fit into the NOAA test bed. So there, there's uh, about a dozen NOAA test bed improving grounds that uh, focus on, on different areas, uh, whether it be hurricanes, aviation, um, you know, severe weather, uh, modeling, et cetera. And our test bed, we're, we're about uh, eight, nine years old, so we're one of the, one of the newer ones. And we forecast on, or focus on um, 
you know, providing improved decision support services for uh, the Alaska region, which includes, you know, the, as David said, the Arctic down to the North Pacific. So we're actually uh, involved in many of the others in some ways. Uh, we, we, you know, a, aviation and others, uh, hydrologic, hydrologic uh, sea ice. Uh, so we're sort of a, a um, sort of a, a kind of a subset of all the others in many ways. But we're, we're primarily focused on, um, you know, research to operations, but as well as, you know, operations to research and trying to facilitate uh, you know, future and upcoming um, research activities that you know, try, hopefully have, will have a pathway eventually into our operations to uh, improve our services. And uh, since we're, we're you know, again, trying to improve our operations and our services to our stakeholders, uh, our verification activities, evaluation activities, we, we tend to focus on the inclusion of forecasters and stakeholders where, where it makes sense. And um, is, you know, forecasters, essentially, they're, they're able to sort of uh, quickly understand where the models might be able to provide the, the best value. They're, they're able to uh, find unusual model biases and artifacts fairly quickly on a daily time frame. So th this is really a subjective method of evaluation, primarily. And also, from a stakeholder perspective, is, well, is this model, is this data useful to me? Is this product useful to me or not? And we can take those that information back and um, you know, try to adjust it uh, as possible. So one of our, our, our primary uh, products that we've, that's been ongoing, but it's also been evolving and, and changing, but it's been ongoing since about 2017, where we've been uh, um, doing a primarily subjective evaluation of, of sea ice models and you know, through various tools and visualizations with a focus on our sea ice analysts and, and our forecasters. And it's several reasons why we're doing this, but but one is you know a lot of CS models are maturing, but but they're still you know, relatively uh, newer and mature compared to I suppose weather models or ocean models in general. And so our current uh, um, process forecast process is very manual, and so we're trying we're trying to really learn where where the guidance is is good enough to provide the information that we need to provide our provide our services and where we can help automate. Um, but also it, it's about, okay, well, the models are fairly new. And so we can provide feedback to the models as to where we see issues, especially during significant changes and where, where we notice the models just aren't really, um, excuse me. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, I, we're having a little issue viewing the slides. I've sort of frozen halfway between the transition. Could you just unshare and reshare them? Oh, there it, oh. it just fixed. There you go. Okay. Thanks. We're looking at evaluating sea ice models. Is that the right slide? That's great. That's the current okay. slide. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And, and so we're also uh, trying to identify gaps of where the models aren't, uh, you know, able to at this point you know, provide useful information for our stakeholders. So uh, really, our initial focus has been on the, the Bering Chuck GCs, um, even down to Cook Inlet, but looking at ice edge concentration, thickness, motion. And especially areas of rapid change. So what we significant events, melting, freezing. And uh, future next up is uh, including ice pressure and expanding to Canadian and possibly Great Lakes waters in the next year or two. So just some, some initial challenges. And so from, from you know evaluation perspective, we you know we, we have several models available to us. And and sort of how do we start this process when all the models have different initializations, different resolutions? And so it quickly became apparent that we really, really had to focus on model to, so evaluating a model with itself in analysis of, as opposed to evaluating models against each other, at least, at least in a direct sense, uh, just because they're, they're so different in, in many ways. And just some examples of um, you know, some of the evaluations that we, we would do. So we'd help you know, forecasters visually detect important trends of ice growth and therefore we could kind of do these uh, you know direct comparisons of um, you know, how each model is doing versus reality and you very visually for some of these specific events and uh, five day difference forecasts uh, between you know, the different models and uh, the uh, elastic CIS for analysis again to kind of help visually see where where things were um, uh, changing And uh, in this case, this is a, a five-day forecast uh, from you know, GOFs and GOPS. And 
you know, particularly just uh, the, the basically you know the red and blue indicate the, the model model error over just five days in in, in this case with a uh, rapid sea ice growth event where actually the models in this case actually uh, over predicted the ice uh, in this five day period quite quite significantly. And uh, again, just kind of highlighting um, you know, those areas and changes and just differences between the, the guidance and So just in the, the opposite of a, a model meltout situation where, um, again, the, the difference between the forecast analysis and then the difference where uh, you know, the model uh, um, essentially uh, uh, you know, prediction was for um, more ice, much more ice than was observed. So the, the ice actually melted much more dramatically over that five day period. So uh, um, just some more examples of uh, um, some of the, the, so the newer techniques of trying to visual for visualization. The uh, area highlighted in dark black is, is the 50, 50 miles from the ice analysis edge. And this is a weak forecast between the Goths and the RTOS models. And just visually showing you know, where, where uh, the model may have more ice than was observed versus less ice than was observed in the, the 50 mile range kind of gives a, a sense of magnitude of, um, of that, those uh, errors. And finally, just another comparison over a seven-day period um, between Goss and, and Arctos again. And you can see just the, the resolution differences, or just the, the significant differences between the Goss versus the Arctos over that seven-day period. And, and so how, and, and, you know, how then we relate that to uh, our, our customers or our potential use of these models and operations. So, and so we do know that, I mean, clearly objective analysis is, is, is extremely important. Uh, and we, we are looking into different techniques to do objective analysis, but, it, but it's from a different viewpoint than I, I think you know, other groups were trying to you know, ascertain the usability um, of that data for our, our stakeholders. Um, so it's, it's so for a, uh, a captain on a ship, it's, well, okay, does this model help answer the questions I need to you know, traverse this area? Or for communities, does this information help me um, with the information I need uh, close to the ice edge? Uh, I'm sorry, close to the coast. So it's it's. Um, but I, I think I think there's great opportunity for for us to be able to work with other groups in, in trying to develop some of these near verification metrics and techniques that you know are be beneficial to both research and operations. So I did want to uh, go over some of our other projects that, that are, are currently uh, um, uh, ongoing. And uh, we have our project right now to uh, uh, develop a seasonal subseasonal guidance for underserved communities in Alaska as it relates to sea ice. And this is really to help with um, community resilience and adaptation to, to climate change. You know, with with uh, you know, reduced sea ice and weaker sea ice, it's having a significant impact on subsistence activities and transportation. You know, less predictable ice uh, um, as well. Unusual weather patterns compared to uh, you know, traditional um, ecological knowledge. So right now we're, we're engaging our communities to find out uh, um, sort of what, what their needs are from, from their perspective and also trying to figure out how, to, how we might communicate uh, new information to them that, that they find useful. And just, uh, uh, this is uh, just a, a Again, just talking point or crude image of um, a seasonal uh, uh, probabilistic sea ice uh, concentration model that uh, we've been working on um, to uh, help uh, uh, try to assess, uh, um, to help provide guidance in terms of uh, uh, you know, sea ice uh, th edge and thickness throughout a season in advance. So helping to with uh, ice formation, ice melt out and ice reliability during the season. Another product uh, that's uh, it's going to be ongoing for the next uh, few years is trying to improve freezing spray algorithms. And uh, freezing spray is the at least has been the, the number one cause of uh, marine fatalities in Alaska waters uh, uh, for the past decade. And so uh, we're trying to take another look at it. And we're trying to do this, uh, uh, but the, the big problem is we don't have in-situ data, or very, very little. So we're trying to engage um, uh, social science groups uh, others, communities, uh, native uh, corporations, uh, anybody to try to, uh, we're building up uh, uh, this uh, uh, you know, informal network to try to gather data for the next uh, winter or two to provide some information to go back and look at um, the algorithms and see if uh, new algorithms need to be uh, 
uh, gendered or others altered. Uh, this is a project that we've uh, have completed uh, it's monitoring drought uh, in Alaska, assessing and monitoring drought in Alaska. So the, the question of what drought is in Alaska is, is very complicated. And the tool sets that we have are, are um, somewhat limited compared to the CONUS. So this is something that we worked on to try to develop some tools to help us um, provide better services and, and heads up to communities. And uh, again, a lot of this was really driven by uh, the, the extreme drought in Southern Alaska in 2019. And it's, uh, and we're very unique in terms of uh, drought evolution compared to the CONUS. Uh, and with that, uh, any, any questions? Go ahead, David. Hi, Eugene. Um, thanks so much for the, um, the great presentation. Uh, I have more questions uh, just on the, the, last, uh, the last bit um, associated with uh, all of the other projects. We'll have to, we'll have to talk offline a little bit more. Um, but I, I, I was really curious, um, uh, and I know I've probably asked you this question in other, um, other ways in our, in our uh, cross LOCIs discussions as well, but um, from, a, from a GOMO uh, ARP perspective, what, um, you know, we already su provide support for the, um, the IABP. Um, what observations would really help, um, help us with the initialization, uh, problem and, um, and, uh, are there particular parameters that are, uh, that are lacking? Um, and finally, uh, is it also a matter of providing more of those, um, more of those observations on the GTS or, you know, what are, what are the rate limiting, uh, factors for us? Thanks. Um, I, I guess there's maybe two two areas with ISO initialization, and um, I think we're we're doing really well with ice edge nowadays with the sa satellite technology. Um, and you know, the, the the rough areas are still ice thickness and ice character. And um, I think you know with that, I, I, you know there's there's you know different satellite based or space based platforms which. Um, you know, really, uh, you know, starting to address some of that, but I think there, there's, there's still certainly gaps. And of course, the refresh rate information is, is pretty long. In, in regards to in situ data, um, I think, you know, there, there's, there's definitely big gaps in terms of the atmosphere and ocean conditions, for, for sure. And, uh, you know, the, just from a weather standpoint, of course, the, the weather, especially during breakup and uh, freeze uh, and meltout are, you know, it's, it's pretty important in terms of ice formation. And we know with just the lack of data that our weather models really, really sort of struggle at times with significant storms and the intensity of the storms in the wave action. Uh, we, we see that quite a bit. Um, so with the, the, you know, I, uh, the uh, Arctic buoys, uh, it's certainly, certainly helpful. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, a, a, big, a big problem to address, but, uh, um, Different uh, diff different aspects about that. I think our, our biggest challenge now that we're we're realizing, and this is sort of new to us, in talking with the communities and understanding what their needs are. But even the ports, even sort of you know like a port of Nome, for instance, as that gets built out, is we really don't have good information about ice quality uh, near the coastline. And our our ice models, um, you know, some of the models have some basic you know shore fast ice dynamics, but a lot don't. So that's that's really sort of a, a difficult area for us in, in terms of trying to provide community support. And the in reality is um, the, the people in the community probably know the, the local ice conditions a lot better than we do. And so I think that that's a, a resource that that you know we're trying to tap into as, as well as others to to, to have, kind of help build build out uh, our gaps in knowledge. Great, thank you. I see that uh, Mike has his hand raised. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Gene, that's that was just a great talk. So interesting. Um, I could I have so many things to say, but uh, one thing is um, is uh, I was just up uh, in Kotzebue with Joshua Zhang, who's also on this call for uh, NOAA's Arctic Air project, uh, twin otters flying around and and measuring stuff, and 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 I dropped some uh, 
some new kinds of small uh, surface drifting ocean buoys, um, measuring surface temperature and surface salinity and surface waves. Uh, a couple of them are still alive. And um, so they're small, they can go through an A-size tube and a twin otter. And um, we're hoping to deploy lots of those in the future so that they were in the Chukchi Sea. Um, hopefully that can help you. Um, and, you know, the other thing we saw when we were up there, this is June, we saw lots of patches of, of ice. So I, I support what you said about quality of ice, you know, just lots of old, small ice, old ice flows, and they're just drifting, they're just getting shoved around by the wind, you know, and I don't know that a model really does that very well. And I don't know about the analysis even, to tell you the truth. Um, so it's not, I mean, it's melting at the same time, but there's just a lot of dynamics going on as well. Uh, wind force dynamics. So it's a it's a tough problem. I, in, in, in other words, um, you know, what is sea ice? You know, and, and so sea ice is, means different things to different people, you know, and, and it, it's a it's not a straightforward question or answer. Yeah, th thanks for your observ your your observation about the ice and, and also the, the new new buoys that you dropped or equipment that you dropped. That's, that's good to know. Is, is that data available in real time by chance? It's available in real time. Uh, we have, I have a website you can go to and, and, and grab it. We didn't put it on the GPS. And so that could be something that we can do in the future. I'll put, I'll put the website on, in the chat, I guess. Great, okay, yeah, that'd be great. And there um, is a question in the chat. I don't know, Sergio, if you want to ask it out loud or if not, I can just read it. I'll go ahead and read it then, which says, is anyone from your team interested in terrestrial or near shore data? If so, can you give examples of what might be of interest? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, certainly, I, what type of information specifically are, are you referring to? Or it's being referred to. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Sergio can yeah. add more um, notes in the chat. Okay, let me uh, take this out. Uh, David? Eugene, I've, I've heard this before, um, and I was, I've, I've, I was pleased to hear it again um, about communities sort of having a better sense of the quality of ice um, uh, near their communities uh, than, uh, than perhaps we do as, um, as forecasters and modelers. And I wonder um, uh, whether there's uh, space for considering some kind of community observing um, sea ice network. Um, and if so, um, would there be any kind of instrumentation that uh, that would be needed, or um, uh, or that you would recommend that would support uh, support those observations or bolster those observations? Um, uh, I guess I guess it's an opportunity. To, I'm, I'm just flagging it as an opportunity for us to think about uh, collaborating maybe in the future. But wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and um, I. You know, I mean, offhand, I, I, I'm not sure if I can really provide much, much information, but I think that's a good area that we might be able to talk more about, you know, in, in what would, what would sort of work from a community perspective, but also for, be useful for, for information that we need. And, you know, going back to Sergio, I, I, I and this, this may not be exactly where, where you're, you're going with this, but, um, but certainly sort of near shore terrestrial, and again, I'm kind of guessing as to what you might mean. Um, there's certainly coastal flooding, erosion, um, you know, the permafrost melt, those are, those are huge challenges. And that, that's an area that we, we don't have a lot of information for, uh, but, but we know is a significant challenge, different significant problem. Um, you know, we, we do have some lower cost uh, 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 Tide gauges now that that are water level gauges that have been very helpful going into some of our smaller communities, but but just that whole whole aspect of erosion, et cetera, is uh, is a huge challenge. Thank you. And I'll uh, Colleen put a note in the chat that there is an indigenous community collecting ice observations in Canada. I'll put a link to that. Um, 
I had a, a question about your stakeholder uh, engagement. Um, I guess I was wondering in part uh, specifically for the sea ice work, uh, the sea ice work, um, how are, who are the specific stakeholders that are using your forecasts and how do you get feedback from them? Is there like a formal process or you're just sort of here informally back from folks? Um, so I think in, ge in general, I mean, we, we do have certain stakeholders in some communities where we, we do have some relationship with, but, but by and large that the, the main reason for this other project is to try to develop those is we, that's one question we don't know exactly. Uh, and we don't know specifically who's using it, um, but we also don't know if they know it's a, what's available. So, so we're sort of going from the aspect of um, what are your needs? And then we can perhaps back out uh, you know, what, what, what we can provide in, in a format that they can use as opposed to kind of going to them first and saying, this is what we have. Um, so we're sort of, they're trying to uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of reverse engineer, I guess, in some ways uh, to, uh, to develop some prototypes that we could, uh, for, for services or briefings or something that we can provide in the future. Great, thank you. Um, so we have 10 more minutes uh, for discussion and I do wanna say this, at, you know, this can be an open discussion, uh, further questions for Nathan as well, or just more general comments. And I'm going to go to Ben first and then come back to you, David. So Ben. Thank you for the interesting presentations. Uh, Jean, um, in response to your comment, uh, can you define stakeholders and the engagement with indigenous communities? And then the approach, well, I'll, the, maybe you can answer the first question before we do a follow-up. And you know, we sort of, sort of use some terms interchangeably, even, even though maybe they shouldn't be. But but in terms of like a stakeholder, I, I consider that those are customers or are, um, yeah, so which, which, which is huge and broad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, God. Specific communities and which organizations, you said stakeholders. So I just want to get an understanding um, and who you're engaging with before. Uh, it's, before. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's, yes, definitely. And um, so that, again, it's very broad. I, I think it's, you know, in, in this in, in this incident, it, it's it's probably comes down to people making decisions about how they use the ice or people in, in the communities that are making decisions at how to plan for um, whatever activities that are related to the ice. I mean, it, it could be it could be shipping, it could be whaling, it could be just other other sort other types of activities. So it, it's, um, but really, of course, our information is available to anybody. But we're, we're really trying to, I think, you know, trying to talk with the the, the people that are are sort of involved in some of these you know, subsistence and transportation activities and other activities that are related to the you know, safety and well building being of the communities. So, which indigenous communities do you did you engage with? Um, right now, we're for this one project. Uh, the the scope is um, to reach out to Ukiah, the Katsubu, in Nome. But but within those, we, we also you know trying to have feelers out to the smaller communities in in those regions. So it, you know, we're, we're using those as the three hubs and uh, and you know, trying to uh, use those also to uh, um, to find information and talk with other communities, smaller communities around those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, David. Maybe what I'd do is um, uh, I would love to. I, I really appreciate that Ben uh, is on the um, on the line, and I wonder whether um, uh, whether there are ways uh, or recommendations that maybe ICC Alaska has to uh, to improve um, uh, to improve or uh, you know maybe change our change and uh, step up our game um, with community engagement um, uh, because I know that's something that we as federal agencies uh, uh, and researchers in general constantly struggle with um, and uh, would love to would love to improve uh, improve the dynamic and improve the um, as a result improve um, safety and improve uh, navigation etc uh, so would love to love to hear your thoughts Ben thank you David uh, for for raising that that comment I do want to thank again the presenters for the interesting presentations and the clarifications on engagement. Um, 
ICC, you know, with Circumpolar Council, does have the equitable and ethical engagement protocols that were published um, very recently. And they are located at iccalaska.org. And the very first protocol is nothing without us, without us. Um, and that really states that, you know, be aware of, of the international um, instruments that are in place, um, in particular UNDRIP or the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and really engaging with Indigenous peoples before a project is implemented to develop those relationships to determine the priorities of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities before a project is implemented and to really garner the interest and in how the project could be beneficial to Indigenous peoples and in the hands of Indigenous peoples. Thank you. And I will post the, the link to our, our, our protocols, EEEE protocols is what we call it. And thank you again. Great, thank you for that. Uh, did you have another question, David? I did, but I, th I think we're running short on time. I would hate to, I, and I, I have access to, to Gene uh, and his team uh, all the time. So I, I would defer to other, other comments and questions. I think it was uh, very interesting to see these two different presentations uh, with, you know, both with the same goals of improving models, but with two, two very different approaches and, and different foci. So um, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, are there any um, further questions or, or comments? Um, anyone want to briefly, you know, advertise some model evaluation activities you're doing yourselves? Also feel free to drop things in the chat. All right, well, with no other comments, I think that we, um, Hazel, do we have any updates? Are, are, do you, are there any upcoming meetings we should mention? I mean, you're on the spot. <laughs> um, I, I don't think there are other meetings to mention right now. Um, I did, I had the Q&A and chat open, so that's my error, so I copied the link over um, from Ben. So thanks for sharing that. Um, you, um, sorry, the meeting recording will be posted on the IARPIC Collaborations website. So you can keep an eye on there or our YouTube channel. And if folks are not members of IARPIC Collaborations and you found this meeting to be interesting and would like to join future meetings, um, please do make an account and I will drop the link for that in the chat. So just thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks to the presenters, especially, and uh, to all of you for an engaging discussion. Great, thank you, everyone. I see okay. a, a hand up on, with Mike. Yep, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering. Um, I guess IARPIC got reorganized, or it's a new five-year thing. Um, is, is this the modeling group, or what? What is this group? So this is. Um, this is a foundational activity group. Um, there is still the modeling community of practice group. Yeah, I know it's a little confusing. So the new IARPIC uh, implementation plan has priority research areas, foundational priority research area collaboration teams, foundational er activity collaboration teams, and communities of practice. And so there are, did I get that right, Hazel? You did, yes. So there are still an observing community of practice and a modeling community of practice. And um, then this MOMP activity is um, sort of helps bring those two groups together and um, trying to touch on things that um, are about integrating modeling and observation. Okay. And Mike, just if that's all too complicated, I would say we're doing our best to keep the sort of outward facing piece as straightforward as possible. So if there are invites and meetings that are relevant to modeling, those will go both to the MOMP team and to modeling and no no need to worry about having your membership absolutely perfect. We'll try to cast a large net when we send the invites out. Okay, just wondering. Thank you.
Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good point that we uh, everyone isn't as uh, ingrained in the uh, the new IRPIC structure as some of us are. So we should do a better job explaining that at the beginning. So thanks for that comment. Request. Yeah, the intent is just to have something that is literally a foundational area of this of this enterprise that cuts across the entirety of the enterprise, and that's that's why this um, monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction group was was established. Um, uh, in that, uh, these activities should theoretically cut across all of the uh, the entire enterprise and connect um, connect it as well. I'm sorry if it's it's a little bit confusing, but it, it's well <laughs> well intentioned confusion. Um, and I think I think Wilbert's dropped off already, but um, but he's uh, he's been in, deeply involved in the modeling um, community of practice as well. I I, I guess is uh I think might you you sometimes you can present your observation to see the like uh, uh, floor size distribution uh, of sea ice uh, like uh, your nineteen ninety two paper. Right now we are using your uh, your formula to do the melting letter melting. So, because uh, we in the lab we break break the ice into small floor, and then we use your formula to to do that kind of work. So, I think uh, that would be really great from observation. Uh, you can show some of the this kind of parameterization, and I think the model will have uh, have some uh, sense uh, from the field and how to improve the model. So right now we are using your formula. So Jaya, are you volunteering to um, provide a future uh, a future webinar uh, in, uh, in cooperation with the CI uh, community of practice? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, like ice, ice wave interaction. So I think you are the expert in this area in observation or, and also series, so. We need to hear from you. Okay, well, all right. Uh, then I'll just take this opportunity to say that, well, like, I, like you mentioned, Wilbur dropped off, but there's going to be uh, a cool meeting uh, next February that is sort of just what this group is supposed to be about, modeling and observations together. And uh, it's the acronym is CAMAS, like the flower, C-A-M-A-S and uh, sponsored by DOE and ONR. And um, I think probably Wilbert and I and Joshu, who, well, yeah, she's still here. Uh, anyway, we probably should give you a seminar, like a little teaser seminar about that sometime before the meeting and then of course after. When, when, are, um, when are abstracts due and all of that kind of stuff? Because it would be nice to get that teaser out while, while there's still opportunity to sort of get yeah. a foot in the door. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but okay. like, we'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> I will, we'll follow up on that. Thank you. And do. Um, just a point, I think, it, yeah, if people do have ideas for future meetings, please uh, let me, David, or Hazel know. We'd, we'd love to hear ideas from the community on what on what you'd like to, to hear more about. And with that, we are a couple minutes over the hour, so I think we're going to end the meeting. But thank you again, everyone, for uh, presentations and for the discussion and, and for those last minute comments. Those were very, very useful. But thank you, everyone. Thanks so much to our presenters thank once you. again. Okay.